good morning. We're going to go ahead and get um, started. And the usual house rules of, of apply. And, and for questions afterwards, please uh, speak up. We do record this and it shouldn't be streamed live. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, Dr. A.J. Marion, who is the James T. Willerson Distinguished Chair of Cardiovascular Research, Professor and Director of the Center of Cardiovascular Genetic Research um, at UT Health. He's part of the Brown Foundation, integral member of the Institute of Molecular Medicine for the Prevention of Human Diseases there since 2006. And really just an extraordinary career including being deputy editor for circulation research, associate editor for European Journal of Clinical Investigation, section editor on genetics for the current opinion in cardiology, and former associ uh, associate editor for circulation. And he's co-authored more than 150 manuscripts, has received grant support from NHLBI, and is really considered an international expert in the area of gen genetics, and specifically, in particular, as it relates to genetics and genomics of cardiomyopathy. So it's a real privilege for Dr. Marion to, for us to have Dr. Marion here, and he's a regular at our cardiovascular, at our grand rounds, because he always does an excellent job, and it's always a welcoming home, if you will. So, AJ, thank, thank you, you, as My always. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My microphone is on. All right. So, this will be a somewhat informal presentation. Please do not hesitate to stop uh, and, uh, you know, uh, express your opinion. And there hopefully won't be very much opinion from my end. So I'll give you a little bit of uh, perspective on genetics, give you a little bit of different talk than the conventional, conventional talk that I give. And I have put this for the first time together. So there will be some glitches, and some parts of it may not flow smoothly, and it's not one of those that I have given routinely. So. Uh, it's just partly because I want this audience, uh, which is a mixed audience, uh, clinicians as well as scientists, to appreciate some of the discoveries that has, have occurred over the years, over the decades, and even in this case, a couple of centuries, whose impact really at the time was totally unclear to scientists at the time or clinicians at the time, but subsequently end up laying the foundation of what we know today. And this go back to, in genetics, to the father of genetics, Professor Gregor Mendel, who was a monk. And as a monk, forgive me, I will make some expressions, but it's not meant to be serious. He was bored and tired of communicating with God, so he had access to his experimental garden. And in this garden, he was crossing beams. I was looking at the height of the plant, number of seeds, color of the leaves, and so forth. And Professor Mendel described heredity. And with that, he described the mode of inheritance that today carry his name. Today, in our genetic research, we call it Mendelian patterns of inheritance, which are either dominant which means if you have one copy of the gene defective, you will have enough problem, you will get the disease. Or recessive, meaning that you may have two copies in order to, you may have, you may have to have two def defective two copies of the genes in order to get the disease. And Mendel indeed himself used the term dominant and recessive. With that, he laid the foundation of genetics, but he had no clue what were these elements of heredity. At that time, even we didn't know DNA was existed. The guy, the distinguished scientist who discovered DNA, and he didn't call it DNA, he called it nuclein, is this professor, professor Meischer, who had the privilege, I should have actually taken the, put up the picture of that castle. He has the privilege of working in a beautiful castle in the mountains of Alps. And he probably was mountain climbing along with Dr. Kleiman. And in that castle, this is his true laboratory that he discovered nuclein. In this laboratory, it's how simple it is, relatively speaking. There's really no equipment there, probably a couple of 
tubes. And, and he dis, he, the way he discovered it, he took the pus from patients, cleaned it up, lysed the pus, lysed the cells with different buffers. He struggled for a while. Took, this is not just overnight discovery. For him, it took a decade to lyse these cells and finally eliminate the cytoplasmic component and come with a substance which was heavy, large, not very much manip subject to manipulation. And he called it nuclein because he realized that it comes from nucleus. And he had no clue what this nuclein was. This distinguished, distinguished chemist, Dr. Koso, he was working also on, on this uh, nuclear material. And he'd start deciphering chemically the constitution, the constituents, the composition of this nuclein. And for the first time, he described adenine, guanine, and thymine, and cytosine. He also went on to describe uracil, xanthine, and many others. He was a chemist. And again, he had no clue what the, how these units of DNA, or nuclein at the time, formed the DNA and functioned. And this distinguished man, Shargoff, he made a very fundamental discovery, exceedingly simple, very simple discovery. But he took the DNA, fixed amount of DNA, and analyzed the number of the units, number of adenine, number of T's, number of C's, and number of G's. He came up with the conclusion that number of A and T, the numbers were always equal. And number of C and the number of G were always equal in DNA. But he couldn't extend his discovery further. He couldn't figure out why. And it's still were an enigma that this molecule, large molecule, composed of four units of A, T, C, G, have a fixed ratio of A to T to T and C to G. Until a beautiful young lady who was a postdoc with, uh, oh, I guess uh, before that discovery, came, uh, at that time, it wasn't known the Misch or Meischer discovery of nuclein was responsible for inheritance. For 75 years after his discovery, people thought it was protein that was responsible for inheritance, not DNA. One fascinating, totally basic science discovery by distinguished gentleman I don't have, Avri, that I don't have his name here on the slide listed uh, on my uh, list of slides. He took the bacteria and infected it with another microorganism called phage. And he noticed that phage can transform bacteria, can make bacteria function differently. You would never imagine that purely basic science discovery will have much clinical implication or genetic implication. But about 10 years later, that was in 1944, eight years later, Professor Hershey and his beautiful uh, postdoc, Professor uh, Martha, they did a fascinating experiment. They took the phage that is supposed to transfect the bacteria label the DNA in the phage. In the next set of experiment, label the protein in the phage. They looked at the bacteria and the daughter bacteria. In this case, let's say E. coli. And they look at those E. coli and say, which one of the daughter, in what condition the E. coli daughter, did it inherit the DNA that was labeled with radioactive material? Or did it inherit the protein that was radioactive? labeled with radioactive protein material. It was the DNA, not the protein. This key, very simple and elegant experiment established for the first time that DNA, or the nuclein that Professor 
my share was discovered, the DNA was what Grigor Mendel was working on as element of heredity. This beautiful experiment established that. Let me see, my next slide comes the lady that I was referring to. So great, now we know DNA, which is in the nucleus, is responsible for inheritance. And we know thus far that it is composed of four units of A, T, C, and G. But how? And people that were working on it was uh, this young lady who was initially training with, uh, uh, with uh, Wilkins, Pro uh, Professor Wilkins at Oxford, and doing x-ray of the DNA. This is the x-ray, it's x-ray crystallography, but let's make it simple, x-ray of the DNA. And let me use my pointer here to illustrate that this x-ray has showed that DNA has two units, two chains. One chain is here, one chain is on the other side, and these two chains seem to cross in the middle. So Rosalind Franklin made this observation that DNA was double-stranded, but she didn't took it further enough until her competition, James Watson and Francis Crick, who saw the picture of Rosalind Franklin, came up with one page paper, one page paper in Nature, describing DNA as a double helix in 1953. And that won the Nobel Prize. Uh, almost everyone that I mentioned here, ex except for Rosalind Franklin, won the Nobel Prize for the discoveries. So this double-stranded structure that they described, and is in this little corner you can appreciate, this structure, is two strands of DNA in which Chargaff rule of A binds to T, and C binds to G, specific base pairing, which is now called Watson-Crick base pairing. It also provides a platform for replication of DNA. They propose in this one page paper, somewhere it says, it has not escaped our attention, you will find it in there somewhere, you can read from here, that this double-stranded structure will provide the opportunity to the strands to get separated from each other. And Chargaff rule of a specific base pairing of A binds to G, T, the new A will come, will find the T on the separated strand and will bind to it. And the same way C will bind to G and DNA will become double stranded. So they discovered this inheritance that Grigor Mendel has observed and called it elements of heredity. Now it became how it gives inheritance. But another key discovery came along with that. How does this happen? And that was the beautiful enzyme, sorry, that discovered by Arthur Kornberg. He is probably the one of the proudest father who won the Nobel Prize because his son also won the Nobel Prize for another discovery in the same field. Arthur Kornberg discovered this enzyme, this beautiful crystallized picture. That is responsible in part, of course, nothing works by a single protein, there are assembly of it, but this is the key protein responsible for replication of DNA, putting the specific base pair when DNA gets separated. Arthur Kornberg described this DNA polymerase which is an amazing enzyme, I'll come back to that, which is the essence of all genetics that we know today in terms of the subtle mistakes that this DNA does. And then at that time, the concept was, okay, now we have identified DNA, we know protein does the cellular function, how does DNA get to protein? concept at that time was there is a direct DNA to protein translation. There is no intermediary step. 
until this distinguished scientist, which I had the pleasure and distinct honor of meeting it one day when he visited our institution, Dr. Sidney Brenner, who is exceedingly witty, hypothesized, actually, he didn't even went on to isolate it, hypothesized that there's an intermediary step. DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein. And then he put three, four of his colleagues together. They discovered the mRNA, messenger RNA. And here's the picture of it shown in conjunction with, with DNA that is being in parts of it. With, when it's thick, it is DNA-RNA hybrid. Our DNA is being synthesized from RNA. When it is not thick, it's sole uh, RNA that is being made. So Sidney Brenner also won Nobel Prize for his discovery. He's still alive. So the key question was, great, we have now DNA. We know DNA makes protein, but before it does make protein, it makes RNA. But how does RNA get translated into protein? What is the code? There are only 20 amino acids there. And we have four nucleotides. Four nucleotides can give you a combination of 64 different combinations. So is there a code, is there a language that the biology recognizes what certain composition of that nucleotides I make an amino acid? And the distinguished gentleman who died a few years ago was Marshall Nuremberg. Marshall Nuremberg, indeed, this is his own handwriting an original discovery that he discovered that every three nucleotides makes one amino acid. Because there are 64 combination of nucleotides and 20 amino acids, therefore there are redundancies. Some amino acids have more than one codon. So he described that, for example, if you see, if the machinery that makes protein comes to DNA strand or mRNA, that sees A, T, G in mRNA instead of T, there is U, uracil, who also fossil described back in earlier slide, as I indicated. A, U, G, he puts a methionine amino acid there. So this fundamental discovery was his. Great, so the race was on. Now we know the DNA structure. We know DNA is responsible for inheritance. How can we go and find the composition of DNA in each individual? Came this brilliant scientist, Professor Frederick Sanger, probably the only biochemist who has won two Nobel Prizes, and probably will be the only one for foreseeable future, the way it works these days, because all shared by three, four people. And Professor Frederick Sanger, did a very simple, and he's one of the truly, truly scientists that near the end of his life, he worked in the laboratory himself. He wasn't like the rest of us. Oh, wow, I'm advancing. I don't know how it happened. His ghost, he died also uh, about what, 2000, uh, just a few years ago, 2000, anyway. So he just recently passed away. So Professor Frederick Sanger also was a very distinguished man. He decided our priority very early in his career then when he hit 65, he would retire and make room for the young investigators to take over. And he did that. Indeed, when he retired, he moved and built a, uh, at Cambridge, built a garden where he was doing his experimentation, became actually a very tourist place. People used to go visit his, still they do, his garden. He was very brilliant. What he did is very, he labeled, he made an analog to this ACTG, which was a little bit deformed. So he labeled those analogs with radioactive material, so, and he made DNA. At that time, enzymes were discovered to make DNA. Every time one of these analogs got into the DNA stranded, it shut it up, terminated, because it was deformed. So therefore, he figured out by running on a gel at what length, what nucleotide was there. And there are usually, this is the way I joined Baylor College of Medicine did my sequencing. This is precisely what I did, and this is precise. This is not my sample. I have my own examples. This is the way we used to do DNA. And you could generate in three, four days, 250 bases of DNA on a gel. If you were good enough, you could you, you, uh, use longer gels, which I was very good at breaking it down and dropping it all the time. 
you could read 800 of those. Never got that far. I was happy with 250. Of course, the world had changed today, and you know the machines now are out there that can sequence the human genome in a day, and the cost is now less than $2,000 the entire genome, which has now, as you know, 3.1 billion units. And of these three, I'm impressed this thing goes fast. Okay, here is that those discoveries led to Human Genome Project that was announced in 2001 by uh, uh, President uh, Clinton as NIH director and uh, another crazy scientist, uh, Venter. They, uh, they announced the uh, sequencing of the human genome. That also is a fascinating story. I'm not going over that because my introductory time is taking more than the talk itself. So he had three point, human genome has 3.2 billion units. There are about 20,000 genes in our genome, not that different than from Drosophila, C. elegans, and anything else. And there are we, what we do, we do DNA sequencing. We focus on about 30 million of those 3 billion. Just keep that in mind. Human genome is very complex. There are huge complexity to it in terms of non-coding components that are regulatory and also make long RNAs that now are becoming very fashionable and interesting to study. We will come back to that. But this DNA machinery that uh, Arthur Kornberg described, uh, for which he won the Nobel Prize in 1955, this DNA, uh, this enzyme is responsible for replicating our genome. This enzyme is amazingly fast and exceedingly accurate. It, it, the task of replacing 3.2 billion, which comes in pairs, by the way, so 6.4 billion units, and putting them together and duplicating us humans in such a precise accuracy is unbelievable. But yet, for some reason, if you believe in God, God made him to do it. If you believe in nature, whatever it happened, does occasional error. I'm so sorry, this is so sensitive. Occasional errors. This enzyme, every 100 million units of DNA that puts together does one mistake. One every 100 million units. So there are 6.4 billion units. There are one error, 100 million. So there are, in each one of us, this enzyme does about 50, 60 error, errors. And those errors are essential for our survival. That's the reason we're not eugenic. We're not precisely identical. We are 99.9% .9 identical. Every 1,000 base pairs, we have one difference among us that is responsible for our diseases, for our health, for all of our psychological issues and everything else, including response to therapy and clinical outcome, in part, not fully. So if you summarize that part, we have, of those 3.2 billion units, we are about, each one of us, 4 million variation in our DNA sequence that differ from the rest of the people, a significant number of them for sure, 50, 60 of them are, our parents even do not have it, unique to us. And of course, of those, a large number of them are potentially dangerous, can affect and cause disease. I'll show you one fascinating story that happens at, at, in this hospital when I was a junior faculty here. This is the story of a tr true story of a patient her history is shown in the back here, in the, in the bottom of the slide. And the, this is fascinating. The only change, that pathological change that we know caused the disease in this patient, look, this little hydroxyl group, what changed to this little amino group. Rest of it, they're all the same. This was in lamin gene, a subtle change, Amino, uh, uh, amino uh, group changed to a hydroxyl group. This patient showed up with acute MI at age 29. 
it, that, was, that wasn't here. She was, uh, this happened in uh, uh, Virginia when she had this MI. Then had bypass, had PCI, her mitral valve degenerated, initial repair, then subsequent replacement, aortic valve degenerated, subsequent replacement, multiple PCIs, six sinus syndrome, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, ablation, pacemaker implantation, right sided heart failure, severe tricuspid regurgitation, death by age 41 when she's being evaluated and actually was. Uh, declined for cardiac transplantation at that hospital, at this hospital. That subtle change, that's the power of DNA, that sometimes some of those tiny little changes can have such a profound impact, but they are exceedingly rare of, in our genome. Of those four million variations that we have, we have only a handful that are significant clinically to make an impact. The majority of them clinically are not impact, although biologically might. However, the most impressive impact of genetics could be summarized in this slide. And a trainee, postdoc, resident, house staff tells me what this is. I will give him 20 bucks. <laughs> or her, I shouldn't be discriminating. This is the power of genetics shown in this slide. This was discovered in 2004 through linkage analysis in a family with FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, by a French group. This is the structure of PCSK9. The rest of it you know far better than I do. Monoclonal antibodies are capable of reducing LDL on top of statins, high dose statins by another 50%. Exceedingly powerful. Clinical outcome remains to be seen, but certainly exceedingly powerful in reducing cholesterol, with some benefit, not, not at the magnitude, perhaps, at reduction in cholesterol. That was the story of genetics. I will come back to genetics of cardiomyopathy a little later. But let me introduce genomics to you as well. The story of genomics also goes back to 19th century. This is the same distinguished man who discovered the nucleotides adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanosine. This distinguished man also discovered the protein called, today we call histone. He did not call it histone at that time. I don't even know what he called it. I have to go back and pull out his papers, if indeed possible. But these histones are protein, DNA-binding proteins. So we have this DNA as double-stranded structure in our genome that you stretch. It's about one meter long. And this DNA is covered by proteins. Those proteins called, one of the, the key one is histone. And histones don't cover the DNA in a contiguous manner. And this was made by the second Dr. Kornberg, the son of Arthur Kornberg. He discovered that DNA is like beads on a strand. You see, the, you see these little beads and you see these strands. The beads are a compacted area of the DNA, and this is the link. To, summer, to show that a little bit better, I show you this cartoon. It's referred to as nucleosome. Here are eight molecules of those histones come together, wrap the DNA around them, and there is a linker area. There is no histone, and again, is another nucleosome. So, so DNA is wrapped in proteins, referred to as histones. Let me tell you what these histones do. These histones can bring all DNA together, as shown in the bottom part. This is compacted area. When the DNA becomes too compact, the machinery that is supposed to come and make RNA and protein cannot reach the DNA. It's compacted, it's dense, Histone is covering it. But histone can become uncompacted, like here. And in that case, the machinery that's supposed to make RNA, we call them transcription, can make RNA. So histones, DNA, chromatin, are dynamic. They can get compacted. They can get relaxed. When they are relaxed, genes are making RNA. When they are compacted, 
genes are shut down, silenced. What regulates this? These proteins can go under modifications. These histones can get phosphorylated, can get methylated, and other modifications happen to this. There are sets of writers, readers, and erasers, they call them. These enzymes can mark these histones with specific signals. When I think I have, yeah, I have a slide to, cartoon to show it to you. So when these histones get, let's say, acetylated, gene get expressed at certain residue, of course. When histones get methylated at lysine 27, three methyl group is added, gene shuts down. So that's genomics. So genetics is the DNA structure with variation. Genomics is the protein composition of the chromatin that covers the DNA and can get modified to active state of gene expression, quiet, be quiet and don't make gene expression. And the way it's regulated, by modification of these histone proteins. DNA itself can get modified as well. Here an example of DNA getting methylated. I'm sorry, I better show it here, here. DNA gets methylated. When DNA gets methylated, it happens in certain part of the genome. If it's in the promoter region of the gene, where the transcription factor binds to make RNA, gene gets shut down. So this level of complexity is referred to as genomics. So how are we going to exploit this genomics and genetics? Now I will bring in cardiomyopathies to tell you briefly about that. Let us argue a little bit about cardiomyopathies. I know the distinguished man sitting there wrote a paper for the compendium that Bromwald is editing uh, uh, for Cirque Research, and he considered inflammatory cardiomyopathy. What a misnomer, <laughs> teasing you. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm, this, I'm talking to Dr. Greenberg who did that. So, uh, uh, the question here is, what is cardiomyopathy? Is uh, there is such a thing as uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy? I call cardiomyopathy, again, I have actually, uh, Bromwald and I writing something together on this compendium. He, he throw away, whatever I read in, I read in, it says garbage, don't bother. <laughs> He's writing himself. <laughs> so I made the point that cardiomyopathies are primary disease of cardiac myocytes. Of course, heart is totally heterocellular organ. Endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, interstitial cells, fibroblasts. Indeed, the most common cell in the heart is endothelial cells, followed by fibroblasts, followed by myocytes. So a disease of endocardium, a disease of endothelial cells, to me, is not cardiomyopathy. So cardiomyopathy is not a disease of myocardium. It's a disease of myocytes, to me. As I said, Bromwell said, garbage, garbage. He really practically said that. He actually called me uh, what? a comedy of errors. <laughs> 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 Truly, he did. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so he is amazing. So. Uh, to me, cardiomyopathy is a primary disease of myocytes. The entire process of cardiomyopathy has to be summarized within the myocytes, either sarcomeres causing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cytoskeletal and sarcomeres causing dilated cardiomyopathy, intercalated disc and desmosome causing erythmogenic cardiomyopathy, and a lot of overlap between them. Mitochondrial disease causing, causing uh, uh, cardiomyopathy, Storage diseases in the myocytes, to me, they are primary cardiomyopathies, such as glycogen storage disease. But inflammatory disease, unless inflammation starts from myocytes, which it does in certain number of the case, including also cardiomyopathy. Let me take the example of uh, our, our approach. I'll skip this. I'm talking too much as usual. I'm a little bit behind. So let me briefly tell you about uh, genetics of cardiomyopathies. I'm not going to belabor and list those things, but I'm going to make points that are, is an issue today for us. So what is our approach? First of all, let me summarize saying that we know about half of the genes for cardiomyopathies, whether it's DCM, HCM, ARVC, or anything else. The other half are not known. Maybe 
you may say 30%, 50%, 60%. That's, let's say approximately half of the genes for cardiomyopathy remains to be discovered. The, what is the current approach? You sending your patient for genetic testing to identify, just Barry did that recently for his ARVC patient, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for genetic testing. But we focus, current genetic testing focuses only on exome, which is this part. That is one person of the genome, which is the protein coding region. And the reason we do that is, is, is the Saturn law. That's where the money is, based on our existing knowledge. When the guy was robbing the bank, they said, why are you robbing, robbing the bank? So where else do you want me to rob? That's where the money is. So we do exome sequencing because that's where the money is. Because this vast majority of the known mutations, two-thirds of the known mutations, are in exome. For, for Mendelian diseases, single gene disorders. The complex diseases are a little bit different. That concept is different. We come to that. So we do exome sequencing. So by definition, you are, have the potential to miss uh, mutations that may be in other parts of the genome and causing diseases. So that's one problem with exome sequencing today. And in the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that has led to an understanding that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a disease of sarcomere. Mutations in sarcomeric genes cause cardiomyopathy, and these are the list of the genes that I have summarized, and here characterized by cardiac hypertrophy and interstitial fibrosis and myocyte disarray. We don't know half of the causal genes for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In the case of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which is characterized by fibroadipocyte. You get this beautiful slide. This is a real, real patient that uh, uh, died, uh, was diagnosed and treated as dilated cardiomyopathy, actually. She, lives in Austin, she used to live in Austin and died. This pathology showed that, indeed, she has severe, severe form of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy by these white cells or fat cells in the heart. And uh, red is muscle, blue is fibrosis. These are caused by mutations in, in segments of the cell cell adhesion molecules referred to as intercalated disc or desmosomes. And there are about five well-established, 10 other potential uh, mutations for it as well. Again, we don't know half of the causal genes for this. In the case of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, the picture even is more complex. There are at least two dozen genes for dilated cardiomyopathy. With Titan, Titan is, uh, is, is, Titan is the largest protein in the body. It is the second largest gene in the body, but the largest protein in the body. It accounts for about 25% of dilated cardiomyopathy just by size, by, because of its size alone. It, it becomes very difficult to. Uh, characterize it because of its size, but nonetheless. So when you do exome sequencing, these are the genes they're looking at. When it happens, you come back in about 30% of the time when you send your sample for sequencing, they come back with a report of pathogenic variant identified. The often, as I said, we know half of it, but in general, the commercial companies are not committed telling you because they don't want the risk. Uh, they don't want to overcall, so they only call those that are definite mutations that are established in the literature. And often it's very disappointing to you, Barry, when you send your patient out, as well as to patient who, who probably spends some money. These days, insurance covers it, but nonetheless, there is some copay. Uh, and, and to you, as a practicing physician, to patient as well. And if I'm doing the uh, research on it, I get disappointed also when I don't get it. So the part of the problem is our concept from Mendel's day that we started with Grigor Mendel to today had changed a little bit. The Mendelian patterns of inheritance apply only for a fraction of cardiomyopathies, those large families. Those are caused by genes that now we have very robustly mapped and identified. Half of the patients with cardiomyopathy, maybe two-thirds of them, don't have a large family. There are small families. There are isolated cases. And in such isolated cases, commercial companies cannot tell you what is the causal mutation. 
they cannot commit to that, and properly so, because every single one of us, as we discussed earlier, have about 10,000 to 15,000 amino acid changing variants in our, in our prote proteome, in our, in our genome. So you're looking at, you, you can't stick out your neck and say, here is a pathogenic mutation. May not be, maybe. So the companies, can, that's the reason they don't call it. So it becomes very difficult to identify the genetic variant in the vast majority of these patients, which are basically this part of the uh, group. You can identify them in genetic testing. And that requires really a sophisticated approach that you re it, become, it will become. Intelligence artificial will, uh, art, uh, will make it possible, uh, artificial intelligence, for us to be able to analyze them. But currently, that's not feasible to go out there so we do what we do, we do our own analysis by looking at all the exome data, sit the bioinformatics and analyze them. And we do find about 30,000 variants in every exome that we send out. Only then, then we look at what is plausible biological pathway trying to find the pathogenic variant. And what we're finding sometimes is that single gene disorders may not be always single gene disorders. Some of them are oligogenic disease, and this is shown in this pedigree, an example of a mom and two, a son and a daughter that have oligogenic HCM. They have mutations in three established genes. If the, these genes were not established causes, I couldn't stick out my neck and say they are causal, but they're established because of HCM and they share that. So that's one concept that is currently changing in that, that is really, uh, to analyze the genetic variants, you really require more than what you get out from the commercial company's printout, otherwise very disappointing. And that will change. And exome sequencing has its own deficiencies, and the field will ultimately mo will move toward uh, uh, whole genome sequencing, not because we're looking at non-exon part of the genome, but because exome sequencing requires capturing these exons. And that is less than ideal often. And in genes such as ion channels, there are 600 of those in the genome with very similar structure. Mapping of those small fragments becomes very difficult. So it's a challenging field. That will change. Again, to, some, to finish the genetic part and move on, move on to a little bit of genomic part, making a point that every single one of us have about 13,000 variants that potentially could be pathogenic meaning affect cell biology function, I can call it potentially important. And we have at least in each, each of us 300 variants that are totally protein function is gone. So therefore, it is very difficult to take a single individual and say, here is the pathogenic variant, and it requires a little bit of more sophistication. So what is happening today, our concept is shifting from identifying the disease-causing variant identifying the risk, genetic risk factors. Now that genetic risk score, that's in my opinion is a shabby idea, but finding all the genetic variants that exist that are potentially could contribute to disease, and that's the next phase. The companies are not doing it because that's at this stage, experimental stage. I'd like to move on quickly to genomics before time runs out. Let me again introduce you back to genomics as I described uh, the, the discovery of histones and the way they work. Here are two strands of DNA. The, the little yellow things mark, uh, mark DNA methylation. As I indicated, DNA methylation is not homogeneous at the, on the genome. There are parts of it methylated, parts are not. Methylation of DNA means suppression of gene expression, meaning silence. These are the blue are histones. Histones uh, they can go more than one million modifications. We have studied only, we as a scientific society, a handful of them. Those that we understand better, for example, this particular signature, histone 3 at lies in 27 position, methylated three times, that's a stop sign. Transcription machinery comes to that, sees that sign on the histone, We'll put the brake on and stop. Won't make transcription. Here is another modification to histone, the same residue on histone 3. There are eight histones, if you recall, I mentioned to you. At position 27, gets acetylated, is a green light. Go. Transcription machinery makes. 
RNA. So we have taken this genetics and genomics applied to laminopathies, which I will describe to you briefly. Lamin is a protein that is a nuclear envelope. Cell, cytos cytoplasmic membrane, cyto cytoplasm, nucleus, nuclear membrane. Nuclear membrane is a thick structure, has a lot of proteins there. One of the key proteins there, the key because we studied it more, is, is lamin. Lamin, when it mutates, it causes a lot of diseases. I showed you one picture earlier, if you recall, in which one tiny hydroxyl group had changed to an amino group, and that caused a disease that I referred to you in this patient, this patient. This is a lamin mutation. A single tiny change in this neutral amino acid, hydroxyl group, to this uh, acidic amino acid, to this neutral amino acid, amino group, led to all these phenotypes, which I call, it's a syndrome, non-syndromic cardiac progeria. This is aging of the heart, but is not syndromic. There is no syndromic progeria. Lamin is, causes hutchinson gilford progeria. Lamin causes dilated cardiomyopathy. Lamin causes conduction defect. These are established. Lamin causes muscular myopathy, skeletal muscle myopathy. Lamin causes lipodystrophy. Lamin can cause insulin resistance. At least 13 distinct diseases have been associated with lamin mutations. They are collectively referred to as laminopathies. Why is that? Partly we think, we don't know the answer, partly because this is a inside the nuclear membrane, it binds to chromatin, which I described to you earlier, is part of those beads on the strand that I showed it to you for which Roger Cornburn won the Nobel Prize. So this lamin modifies the chromatin. It interacts with one third of the genome. It wraps the DNA. The way it, the mutations affect wrapping of the DNA by this molecule makes that part of DNA to be exposed or not to be exposed. This is our hypothesis, of course. But it's largely supported by very much basic science research that lamin does that. So we are studying laminopathies in this case. We think lamin, by binding to chromatin, by effect modification of histones that I told you, either stop sign or go, methylation of DNA when methylation is stopped, not methylated, make gene expression, and cardiomyopathy. Our approach is to analyze. I explained this one time I gave a talk. I'll be very brief on this. We look at DNA methylation. We study 500,000 sites in the genome for methylation. Therefore, the graph shown is a little bit complicated. And we compare that methylation site, each, five, each site in normal individual. These are about nine normal hearts, whatever normal human heart means, you know, explanted and you know, processing it, they're semi normal. And dilated cardiomyopathy caused by laminopathy. The, 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 this is a correlation between the two, the same correlation we do on every day in our life. And uh, this is low magnification, showing the vast majority of the sites that we analyze, 500,000 sites, they are hypomethylated, both in control as well as in disease state, which means gene expression is active. A small fraction are hypermethylated, which means gene expression is silent. And this is differential between the two. These are the ones that are more active in lamin mutation. These are the ones on the lower end more active in controls. We use this data and say, OK, this is methylated or unmethylated. You have to link it to biology, which we do. We go back to RNA. I didn't put this histone part of it. That's also in here. RNA, this is we call volcano plot. And we look at anything above this black line is significant. 
is significant. We use this false discovery rate, not p-value, because there are about 25,000 transcripts every time you analyze that. So you, you, know, you will have false discovery if you, don't, you do p-values. Blue is the ones that are le transcript levels are reduced. Green is the RNA level are increased. This is full change. For example, here is full change, four time increase. Here is four time decrease. So this is called differential gene expression. Why are we doing this? We're trying to understand this so we can intervene, find novel understanding into concept of the disease, pathogenesis of the disease, and ultimately treatment of it. So I'll give you one example of it. But in human, we can't move on to do uh, treatment, so we go model organisms. So we replicate our finding in human samples in mouse. I should say we test for replication. If it is replicatable, then we move on to do that. And here is the mouse data on the same gene expression. Again, I was mentioned we're doing lamin, mutate, lamin analysis. In lamin, you can appreciate again, same pattern. So there are some genes are up, some genes are down. What to do with it? We want to know how. To do how, there are mechanisms where we can go back. Uh, I showed this one. Uh, this is, okay. There are mechanisms that we can go back and identify what are these subset of transcript uh, genes that are regulated? What are the transcription factors that regulates them? So the way, as you discussed in the introductory comments, transcription factors combine to DNA and make transcribe RNA. Now we have looked at RNA. Each transcription factor targets from somewhere 50 to 2,000 different genes. So by doing Look at clustering them together. You can tell us which transcription factor. When we do this, the top one shows in our list, in which there are more than 100 genes involved, is FOXO transcription factors. And of course, you can appreciate there are a dozen others. These are activated transcription factors in our lamin heart. There are also suppressed transcription factors that are summarized here in the lamin heart. So a bunch of... Uh, uh, Transcription factors are activated, a number of them are suppressed in lamin. When the lamin, again, it's not surprising because lamin regulates one third of the genome. We focus on one. Here is a FOXO. There are about 809 genes that are differentially expressed in the lamin heart. Of those, that these are twofold or certain criteria, of those, about 140, 147 of those are targeted by FOXO. And here shown in this pie chart that is shown, and this is called individual there are five mice in each group. You can appreciate this is our lamin deficient. Red means high, yellow means low. These are upregulated genes in the lamin heart. These are compared to wild type. And we verify that by protein level as well. This is level of inactive form of FOXO, which is reduced, meaning active form is increased. This is this minus that. So, so we use this finding. See, okay, FOXO activated in the heart. What is, what is, what are is biological effects? And we look into this. That comes Barry's interesting inflammatory hypothesis. Inflammation shows up first. In lamin-deficient mice, genes involved in inflammatory pathways of NF-kappa B are the most activated pathways in the heart, followed by a number of others that are shown here. These are, make, these are listing of those. These are graphic illustration of the pathway in terms of number of genes involved, strength of the signal, and so forth. These are the various ways of showing it. So, and we go on and measure cytokines in the heart of lamin deficient mice. You can appreciate, shown in red, about six different cytokines levels are increased, some by several fold. What are the cellular effects of this activation of inflammation and lamin deficiency? We see apoptosis, we see altered mitochondrial metabolism for the sake of time. I will not explain these figures. Cells die, consequently. This is called apoptosis. And heart function in, uh, gets reduced rapidly. And these mice die 
within 56 days, 54 days, all of them are dead. So now that we have understood this, can we intervene to target FOXO? There are a lot of things co could correlate. Doesn't mean they are causal. So we have AAV9, adeno-associated virus-mediated gene transfer. And we do it very early in mice, because these mice die quickly. So you do it at when they're day two, day four, and day six, inject them. And this simply, the lower panel showed that we have been able to shut down FOXO, shown in green. This is, oh, sorry, let me go here. FOXO, shown in green. This is, Fox, this is the main FOXO we're targeting, FOXO3. We can shut it down very nicely at protein level. So when you shut down, the markers of apoptosis go down, shown in green, compared to your untreated mice. This is control, black is control, red is untreated mice, green is treated mice. Five markers of apoptosis go down. Apoptosis itself analyzed at cellular level. These are, are gene transfection. These are tagged by fluorescence protein. Apoptosis goes down. Here's quantitative data. And these mice, survival improved significantly shown in green compared to untreated mice. So it shows us one thing. First of all, targeting one pathway has some impact, doubles the survival in our mouse model. Of course, we couldn't do this experiment in, in, in human, but the original discovery was in human RNA transcript. Now we have to figure out ultimately to test this, extend this to human studies to see indeed FOXO is activated in human heart failure or not. And if so, ultimately targeting a FOXO in human heart could be another intervention that might improve survival another 5, 10, 20, maybe up to 50% if you are optimistic like this mice. And, uh, but those are the things that you gain from genomics, some hits, some clues that ultimately you, ultimately you hope to take to the bedside. At the same time, we learn from this that targeting a single pathway is not going to be sufficient to cure a complex disease such as heart failure or any other complex phenotype. Require targeting of multiple pathways. I showed you FOXO was one of the most upregulated one, but where two dozen, a dozen were upregulated, another dozen downregulated. So pharmacological treatment of heart failure is not going to be single agent, single pathway targeting, but multiple agents, multiple pathway targeting because the complexity of it, based on what I showed it to you, it is a co to complex phenotype arising from multiple mechanisms. That was the, my presentation on genetics and genomics and how we can take those and hopefully ultimately bring it to the best side. Again, I'm grateful for the opportunity and thank you very much for staying and listening on this potentially stormy day. Thank you. Aaron, thank you for that My fantastic, thank you. Um, comprehensive review thank you. and reminding us about the basics, genetics and genomics. And if you're interested in uh, audience uh, questions, specifically as it relates to possible interventions. Dr. Kleinman is upset that I didn't put Avri's slide in there. 1944, Chase, Avri, I will put that next time. How did you know what I was thinking? Of course. Which is going to lead to my question when it's my turn. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so speaking of Avery, uh, the, I'd like you to get into the brains of some of those dead guys in bow ties and their colleagues. Um, so, you know, Avery, Chargraf, uh, made some very fundamental discoveries that we utilize day in and day out, or at least you do, and trickles down or, to us. Uh, at the time, I'm sure someone said, Dr. Avery, where's this going to take us yeah, clinically? Right, right. Uh, how would he have answered? How would his colleagues have answered? What are we supposed to do? I don't know. I mean, this is a fundamental point that you're making, which is applicable to any novel discovery, always considered uh, irrelevant or, you know, and what are, what are the four phases of discoveries? You guys know better. I mean, you know, first, ah, garbage, denial, and say, well, maybe incremental. Well, I knew it all along. I have, that's always, you know, that's the nature of it. But you, I mean, the same story with uh, my shirt that I showed it to you. I mean, he was ignored for years. Like, ah, garbage. Who knows? Seventy-five years, and the same with 
you know, uh, ba bacteriophage story that uh, Avri did, I mean, you know, who would have known the impact of it back then? It's, so my, my, I do a lot of reviews for NIH. I've been on more than 100 different study sections. And I always argue, we do not, we judge the science, we don't, the NIH always want us to see what is the impact of the science? The answer is we don't know. Just make the fundamental discovery, make the solid discovery. Don't worry about impact. But the first paragraph of every grant application. Yes, 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 sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, has said cardiac disease is the leading killer of, you know, adults right, right, in yeah, right, the yeah. Western world. And the first paragraph always talks about where the clinical focus is. The last right. paragraph, the same, and the same for the discussion. Right. Was that the case? And that's precisely the reason that my first 20 slides were historic aspects of this basic discoveries that none of us ever would have thought is relevant to what we do today. And to me, to every single one of them, I didn't comprehensively show it. I got reprimanded for it. I wish I knew. I don't know. I have not, to be honest. I might, uh, Scratch of the history has been very, uh, my review of history very, very scratchy and superficial has not been deep enough. Uh, but the only paper that I read, which was, I was amazed how much information was out there, was the Meischer discovery of DNA, how much how it was working with pus, and cleaning up and lysing in different buffers. I mean, you know, it's uh, right. At that time, they were just discovering it. And unfortunately, today's emphasis on translate, 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 I worry that it's killing science. But, so we end up doing a lot of superficial things and trying to translate something that we, we don't discover. Hey, Jay, that was a, a spectacular Thank you. talk. Thank uh, you. Thanks for that. Um, the, uh, we're studying a, a laminopathy also, and the HGPS, which of you, course, you, of you course. Really mentioned. And I don't know if our observations are relevant to, to, to the laminopathy that you described in the heart, but um, we, we see something very similar to what you described in the HGPS uh, cells, the cells right. from these children. Um, they're, they're in an inflammatory state. They're producing inflammatory yep, cytokines. Yep. They uh, are in a pro-apoptotic state. They, they, they don't proliferate well. Uh, the nucleus is deformed because of this laminopathy. Right. It causes right. global changes in the nuclear architecture. But we made one change in, in those cells, and everything got better. Um, and it's, it's something I, I need to talk to you about. But one of the things that occurs in HGPS is there's telomere erosion. Sure. And, uh, my guys um, and I, we, we looked to see if we could, uh, by extending the telomere, have uh, uh, show some benefit. And it was re quite remarkable what we saw. In addition to getting a marked improvement in the ability of these cells to replicate, their function was restored. They were rejuvenated. Um, uh, the inflammatory cytokines, the uh, senescence-associated secretory right, profile, right, which right, you right, talked right, about, the right. inflammatory cytokines, that went away. The, 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 the sure. inflammatory cytokines went down. So there are global improvements in, in uh, gene function uh, just by making one change and in, in, by uh, increasing the length of the telomere using RNA telomerase. Right, uh, right. So I think it's possible that uh, you can make a, a, a single change and have a, a global benefit. Uh, in these laminopathies, at least with HGPS, it seems that the telomere erosion that occurs in, in those cells is a, is a major determinant of the senescent phenotype. I share that view. It's certainly uh, telomerase activity, telomere length, and, and laminopathies have been linked uh, to aging, no question, and is, is, is underlying basis of senescence is through telomere shortening, one of the uh, mechanisms that I think quite plausible. Love to know the intervention you did. You did. <laughs> RNA telomerase. I see, just, yeah, overexpressing it? Uh, yeah, just a tran transient transfection. Just, yeah. just, uh, just a single transfection has a benefit. So beautiful talk. I really enjoyed the So Barry, at the end, we concluded that inflammatory cardiomyopathy exists. <laughs> and it's all genetic. So, no, but, so we know that even in patients with, with genetic cardiomyopathies, they do have an inflammatory aspect, and they sure. do have more yeah. presence of autoantibodies, et cetera. So I mean, the, the interplay between those, there, there's a lot that, that's to, yet to be discovered. And in, in, in your study, when you looked at the turn, changing the gene expression of POXO, did you look at the if, Inflammatory markers yes. were downregulated. Yes. They normalize. We have looked at uh, at RNA level cytokines, the same set of genes that I showed, 
uh, they are normalized. So this actually, that part will be in CATS competition and we'll be presenting that data with one of my postdocs at the AHA. Fantastic. Yes, Professor Noon. Always a delight and pleasure, sir. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Oh, we enjoy having the, the, our distinguished uh, mentors. We truly, you and Kinyonis next to each other. It's an honor to be here. That's right. Good old he's days of. He's older. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good old days where you guys had the black tape on Funder and ICU. Your residents could have crossed that. Speaking as a surgeon, obviously, uh, we've been very interested in the evolution of the morphological uh, concept of uh, oakum, not just being a little lump under yeah. the aortic valve, uh, rather something can appear at the apex or in the lateral sure, valve, sure. all over. And I was just wondering whether there had been any marker or predictor identified of the morphology of the disease. Right. At genetic level, it seems to be there is no distinction between apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and asymmetric septal hypertrophic form. They have not, I have not seen data on lateral hypertrophy and posterior wall in terms of biomarkers or genetic. But genetics of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy largely similar to genetics of the typical hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or non-obstructive cardiomyopathy. But why is that so different, uh, you know, it's so heterogeneous involvement of different regions, very perplexes me and I really don't have a good answer for it. And is, is, are there any genes that predispose for people to go from having mild <coughs> cardiomyopathy they live with all their life to the more severe forms that end up needing surgery or operation? Uh, the, the answer is we do not know. I, I have not seen any reliable, reliable predictors at genetics or non-genetics of determining the severity of the disease or local form of the disease. There's, no, there's so much still unknown. I mean, mutations in the same gene can cause either hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy. Why is so contrasting phenotypes caused by the same gene is perplexing. Lamin is a very good example, causing 13 distinct phenotypes. Lamin causes dilated cardiomyopathy as well as arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Has been reported in hypertrophy, but that's questionable. The data is questionable. AJ, hey, hey, just yes, sir. everybody's comment. It's just great presentation. Thank uh, you. Along the same lines, at one time, when you were starting with Dr. Roberts and looking at these families, yeah. you had these malignant families that people right, died. Right, so right, 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 that's good that has certain genes, so right. we, were, we, we used to think, okay, there are certain genes that really put people at risk right. for sudden death and others that don't. Right. Is that still maturing as a concept? And if so, have we learned more about how those genes impact sudden cardiac death? Is it because they also have an effect in the electrical system? You know, what, what, how much more do we know right. from what we right. used to say 20 years ago? It is. Uh, Anytime new discoveries come, we all are over exuberant. And I will say initial studies of, uh, was largely over exuberance. As you know, our own group, uh, actually the only time uh, my uh, five seconds fame, fame on Voice of America was telling them about sudden cardiac death genes. But they are, the, one, some, one astute colleague made the point to me, said, but AJ, that's N equal one, is one family. So yes, there are families in which the disease is severe. So we call malignant families, so-called. 50% of people die by, before age 50 by, from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are also benign that you do see on routine basis, on daily basis, that basically presence of HCM mutation doesn't impact significantly on the survival. The challenge has been, is it because of the point mutation that they have or other genetic variants that they have or additional non-genetic factor, that has not been deciphered. When we initially were part of the crew, we were naive enough, I'm speaking for myself, you witnessed it back then, <laughs> and that to, at that time to conclude that 403 mutation that you're referring to is a malignant mutation. That has been, to some degree, seems to be the case in the families that described, but I would not be surprised 403 mutation in another family 
to be less you know, be benign. There's so much variability within mutations as well, within the individuals with the same mutation, that is very hard to, again, that's the reason I worry the concept is not as one-to-one -one relationship on black and white, but rather the gradient of effect, numerous factors co come together and give the clinical phenotype. Yeah, so in, in the strategy of trying to predict which patient we might want to put an ICD, the genetics are not going to help us at this point. I would suggest that at the present time, genetics do not have any role in determining how to intervene clinically. The impact of it is finding people who are at risk early on and doing the clinical work on those. Let's say we call cascade screening in family members, in children that are born to people with HCM. It helps a lot. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. My gratitude. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Absolutely.